Hello, this is a school friendly version of this video, so there's no swearing or any adult themes. Please enjoy the video. To quote the great Stephen Hawking, Life on Earth is about a <laughs> Life on Earth is about a six. Honestly, sometimes it's hard just to get through the week without hearing those two horrible words. Month kerfuffle. No, cl climate change. I recently realized I don't know much about climate change at all. For many of us, it's just this all-encompassing term for bad stuff we're endlessly told to worry about. Today, I'm going to explain the facts about climate change using normal human words, without telling you what to think. I won't even tell you to go vegan. And that's a promise. Excuse me? Humans obsessively keep track of everything going on on Earth, from the exact amount of water a carrot plant needs to thrive to the likelihood of being mortally wounded by a tumble dryer. I mean, we measure raindrops in deserts, whiskers missing from kittens, how toxic is copper, are gloves warmer than mittens? This video has been demonetized for copyright infringement. Where I'm going with all this is one thing humans have been pretty obsessively measuring for the past hundred years is the Earth's temperature. And a great example of this is the British East India Company. Bet you didn't see that one coming. At its peak near the start of the 19th century, this company had a total of around 450 ships in service over a period of about 40 years. These ships travelled all over the Atlantic and Indian oceans. And you know what they were doing? Other than promoting England's tyrannical occupation of India and further propagation of the slave trade? Well, most, if not all of their ships were taking daily measurements of their exact locations, wind speed, air pressure and temperature. We've actually gained from using the logs on these boats 273,000 different weather and climate records from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. It wasn't just the British East India Company either. Boat people clearly just didn't have much else going on. Sushi hadn't been invented yet, so what else was there to do? Water over here, water over there, and if you look down, well, golly gosh, it's some planks of wood. Better measure the wind speed again. Here's a random entry from a Dutch ship's logbook the day they encountered another British ship, as well as writing a dissertation on, I don't know, clogs. They somehow found the time to draw a picture of the ship so detailed you wonder how they got anything else done. So we're under attack. Wait, wait, I've just got to get this line right. So it's all over. It's just these ruddy sails. So what we found from our frankly obsessive measuring of the planet is that over the last 100 years or so, things look like they have been getting warmer, as this graph shows. <gasps> What this generally means is as we go back in time on this graph, it looks like the Earth was on average getting colder. And as we go forward in time, it looks like it's on average getting hotter. The thing is, how do we know what the reason for this is? Well, to work it out, let's look at the kind of things that can cause temperature increases on Earth. Let's start with the most obvious one, the sun. Su sun, sorry, the sun. So how do we know the sun isn't just getting warmer? No, no, don't tell me, don't tell me. We've been measuring it, haven't we? Oh, get a life, NASA! NASA have actually been using satellites to measure the amount of energy reaching Earth from the sun since the late 1970s. This graph also tells us that we've not really seen an overall increase in the energy from the sun since around the 1950s. If we add the changes to the Earth's temperature we've seen over this same amount of time, we see the average surface temperature of the Earth has been steadily increasing, while the amount of energy we get from the sun has actually been slowly decreasing. We have data going back to the 1880s because Humans have accurately kept an eye on the number of dark spots on the sun for hundreds of years. These are apparently cooler areas of the sun, so can be fairly accurately be used to estimate the average temperature of the sun going back. What are you doing, Copernicus? Uh, measuring the number of dark spots on the sun. Why, though? I have no idea. I'm completely blind now. So another possible reason we're seeing an increase in our temperature is that the Earth is warming up as part of its natural cycle, and we're now at a time where the Earth should just be getting hotter. And this seems perfectly reasonable too. So here's a graph of how the Earth's temperature has changed over the last 800,000 years. Excuse me, what? I bet you're wondering how that was ever worked out. Well, do you know how we found that 5,000 year old man buried in ice? Oh, oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, it? I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce that. By looking at we learnt loads about what humans were like 5,000 years ago. And we can do a similar thing with the Earth's temperature and very old ice. If we can find ice that's 800,000 years old, we can actually learn about what the temperature on Earth was like when that ice froze. The ice in Greenland and, and, Ar and Antarctica is perfect for this because it actually goes down for miles and miles. The further you go down, the older the ice gets. As we go down too, we also see different layers indicating the different years the ice formed. Like how the rings in a tree show its age. The thing is, surely to go back even a hundred thousand years, we'd have to dig for miles and miles deep into the ice and that's what they did. Jesus, imagine meeting these people at a party. So what do you do? I'm an investment banker. 
And you? I dig out and examine miles of ice cores found deep in Antarctica and use them to measure the Earth's temperature. Would you like a drink? Yes, please. We can also do something similar by looking at very old shells of animals in the layers of sediment under the sea. Under the sea! This has left us with a pretty good idea of what the temperature on Earth has been like for the last 800,000 years. And without a doubt, it's all over the damn place! Surprisingly, the Earth does not like to stay the same temperature at all. And it definitely wasn't humans causing this big jump 800,000 years ago by suddenly driving their cars to work unless Utsi here has been hiding something. I knew it! So the increase in the Earth's temperature we're seeing right now could just be one of those jumps we've seen loads of before happening again. So to know if that's the case, let's look into what caused these big changes in the Earth's temperature in the past. And to answer that, we need to look into the Milankovitch cycles, which were invented by Milutin Milankovitch. Let's zoom in a bit then and look at a graph that instead specialises on the Earth's temperature changes over only the last 400,000 years instead. Oh good grief, who makes these graphs? Here, this one is less nightmarish to look at. If we look closely at this then, we can see the Earth's temperature follows a pattern every 100,000 years or so, where it starts at around the sort of temperature we are now, then gets colder for around 90,000 years, which is called a glacial. Then it gets warm for about 10,000 years, which is called an interglacial. This is basically where we are now. Things then sort of repeat themselves, and this is just how the Earth rolls. <laughs> this is honestly a little bit crazy. Most of the time, the Earth is actually 5 to 10 Celsius colder than it is today. In the grand scheme of things, it's like the Earth has popped the heating on for a few hours and the entire human civilization has developed before it's had a chance to cool down. I mean, for 90,000 years until roughly 10,000 years ago, Canada was almost completely covered in ice. Hmm, maybe this frozen period wasn't too bad then. But why? Why does this cycle happen? Well, that's where Milankovitch and his cycles come in. The Milankovitch cycles are all about the Earth and its orbit as it travels around the Sun. So here is the Earth going around the Sun. 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 I know what it's called! If we look at the Earth, we can see it has something called obliquity. <laughs> <laughs> this just means the Earth's tilt. You see, the Earth is actually slightly tilted on its axis. So instead of the top and the bottom of the Earth getting the exact same amount of sun at any one time, it actually varies over the course of a year. In July, for example, the top half of the Earth is tilted towards the sun. This means the upper hemisphere gets far more energy than the lower, which gives that part of the world its summer. The opposite is true for the lower hemisphere too, of course, which is why Australia has winter in July. The freaks! The thing is, our tilt isn't always the same. The Earth actually goes from a tilt of 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees and back again. And this all happens in a cycle. Its whole tilt to its maximum and back again only takes 41,000 years. Oh well, blink and you'll miss it! It tilts like this because the other planets that travel around the solar system actually tug on the Earth with their gravity, causing it to wobble up and down. This is very important because when the Earth reaches its maximum, maximum tilt, tilt of 24.5 degrees, it makes things even more toasty and warm in the summers. This situation of high Earth tilt is what causes the planet to get warmer and warmer, ending glacial periods and causing these spiky increases in the Earth's temperature. An example of this was around 10,000 years ago. And around that same time, we saw the end to the glacial period going on and the Earth suddenly got nice and hot and we were able to properly set up shop. There are a few other things about our orbit that change that result in these sorts of events, but obliquity is generally the most significant. Based on this theory, <laughs> excuse me. Based on this theory then, it's sensible to say that perhaps we are getting warmer because we are tilting more towards the sun. The issue with this though is we just had our maximum tilt 10,000 years ago when that glacial period ended. We are now actually tilting away from the sun again. The takeaway from all this though is that our tilt changes very slowly. A change of just 2 degrees takes almost 20,000 years. Like the sun, the earth is incredibly stable most of the time and things change very slowly. As the earth comes out of its glacial periods like we've discussed, its temperature rises by about 4 to 7 degrees. And this generally happens over the course of about 5,000 years. In the past 100 years on Earth, we've seen our temperature rise by about 1.1 degrees. This means things are getting hotter roughly 10 times faster than we would usually see, at a time where things look like they should be getting a little bit colder. It's like putting your ice cream in the freezer, then opening it later only to find it's caught fire. So we've had a good look. So we've had a good look so far at the Earth's temperature in the past, but haven't really found anything definitive that could explain this sudden increase we've seen over the last 100 years. The next big theory we can talk about relates to the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. Since no one's really talked about that one much yet. Granted, you hear a lot about CO2 nowadays, but why? 
Well, <laughs> well, it all starts with the sun, which is very hot. Right, that's that one off the list. What's next? Oh, magnifique! The sun keeps us pretty warm, but strangely, it's not enough to really keep us going. On Earth, if we didn't have an atmosphere, our average temperature would actually be around minus 18 Celsius. This is mainly because at night, when the sun isn't facing us, we would lose all our heat to the cold, unforgiving depths of space and freeze to death. Jolly good. The reason we stay toasty is because there are certain gases that surround us called greenhouse gases keeping us warm. The main gases are, of course, hato, kotu, and chf, chf, four. Now, you would be right in thinking that these gases should just float away into space. But you see, the Earth is very big. See, now we're getting somewhere. Because the Earth is so big, its gravity holds in all these gases around it and they can't escape. These gases that surround us absorb heat energy from the sun, or heat energy that the Earth gives off. A little bit like a sponge. Then after a while, they shoot it all back out again in all directions and the Earth soaks up some of this energy. Like a sponge. This means the Earth gets much more heat energy fired at it and things are a lot warmer than they would be without these gases. As a result, the average temperature on Earth is about 15 Celsius and we can live on it. Just about. Basically, without this layer of gases and their warming effect, we would just be an icy ball floating around in the vacuum of space. We'd be like Mars, and you saw what happened to Jason Bourne there. He had to fertilize his own poo. So that's how CO2 works. And as we've discussed, humans just can't stop measuring things. So here's a graph showing how the CO2 concentration on Earth has changed going back to 803,719 BCE. What is this? Someone's address? Sorry, no, this just means this graph is going back 800,000 years. But again, how do we know how much CO2 was actually in the Earth's atmosphere going back all this time? Well, you know when we dug up all that ice in Antarctica that went back 800,000 years? Well, that ice, just like all ice, has got little bubbles of gas trapped inside it. So the older the ice, the older the gas trapped inside it will be. So all we need to do is extract the air from very old ice, analyze the amount of CO2 in it, and that gives us a snapshot of what the atmosphere on Earth was like when that ice froze hundreds of thousands of years ago. Interestingly, when we look at this graph closely, we find that over the last 800,000 years, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the average temperature of the Earth seem to be very closely related. Generally, when the temperature of the Earth goes up, so does the concentration of CO2, and vice versa. But if we were to overlap these graphs, like some sort of mad graph scientist, then zoom in, we see something very interesting. Now, I've tried to shield you from particularly boring graphs so far, but this one, it must be done. I'm removing the bag. <gasps> this is a graph of the warming that took place at the end of the last glacial period, but zoomed in on. The red line here is the temperature in the Antarctic, and the blue line is the Earth's CO2 concentration. When the Earth warmed up 20,000 years ago, we can see that it first got warmer, then CO2 levels started to rise. We can see a similar thing here in this equally unpleasant graph. In, se <laughs> in several instances over the last 800,000 years, it seems the Earth's temperature first drops, then the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere drop. What all this appears to mean is CO2 does not drive the Earth getting warmer or colder. Holy fudge, it's a smoking gun! This is a very important point, especially if you're skeptical to current claims that CO2 is what is causing the temperature to rise. You see, if we look at what's going on today, it looks like CO2 levels started increasing in the late 1800s, and then we began to see an increase in the Earth's temperature shortly after. To understand everything that's going on here, let's look into the temperature rise at the end of the last glacial period. As we've discussed, this increase was likely caused by the Milankovitch cycles making the summers on Earth much hotter. But what does this have to do with CO2? Well, the answer to this can be explained using coke. Okay, so here is a cold can of coke. This represents the chilly earth before the Milankovitch cycles warmed it up a bit. And here is a slightly warm can of coke. This represents the Earth after the Milankovitch cycles warmed it up a little. Now before we start our experiment, we need to know that gases can dissolve in water in almost the exact same way salt can. Coke is effectively just flavoured water with lots of CO2 dissolved in it, and this makes it bubbly. When we open a can, CO2 comes out of the liquid and escapes as a gas. But a fascinating property of most liquids is the colder they are, the more gas that can dissolve into them. This is just a law of nature and is explained in a branch of chemistry called physical chemistry. I really hate physical chemistry. <laughs> so when I open the cold can ASMR style, but when I open the warmer can ASMR styles, we have noticeably more CO2 being released. I really didn't think that that would work. 
fuck? <laughs> this is because warm liquids can't hold on to as much gas as cold liquids. This is why a warm can of coke will give off more gas. What I'm getting at here is that after the Milankovitch cycles caused the Earth to warm up a little, the seas would have had to have start releasing more of the CO2 they had dissolved in them, since warmer liquids can't hold on to as much gas. This is likely to be part of the reason why we see an increase in CO2 concentrations on Earth just after we see a temperature increase. This is also quite relevant because kickstarting the end of a glacial period actually needs quite a bit more heat than what we would get from the Earth tilting an extra two degrees towards the sun. You see, many of the recent glacial periods have lasted around 90,000 years. Coming out of them definitely seems to require a bit of extra oomph. Oomph. So what seems to happen is the Earth is warmed slightly by the Milankovitch cycles. This then causes the seas to release more CO2. This CO2 then increases the Earth's greenhouse effect, making it even warmer, which in turn causes the seas to release even more CO2, and things very quickly get warmer and warmer. This is demonstrated on this lovely graph here. This graph also shows the Earth getting warmer at the end of the last glacial period like the one we saw before, but this one is a little bit more detailed and uses every method we have available to estimate the Earth's average temperature as accurately as possible. So, here the CO2 levels of the atmosphere are listed as yellow dots, and the blue line is the Earth's average temperature. If we look closely, we can see the Earth's temperature did lead CO2 levels initially. But 90% of the Earth's warming only happened after we saw a major increase in CO2 levels, which would have been caused by the seas releasing CO2 after the initial warming of the Earth. And once this rise did happen, CO2 levels are what led the Earth's temperature increase. Temperature and CO2 levels do seem to be completely related. One has almost always affected the other. So this is probably why scientists are getting their knickers in a bit of a twist. If we look back 800,000 years, we see the Earth's CO2 concentration has an ever really made it above 300 ppm. ppm just being a measure of concentration of CO2. But in just the last 100 years, CO2 levels have increased to over 400 ppm, meaning the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is now 33% higher than we've ever known it to be in the last 800,000 years. Shortly after this CO2 increase, we've also seen a temperature rise on Earth of around 1.1 Celsius that has happened 5 to 10 times faster than almost any other global temperature rise we've ever measured. This change to our temperature is happening even though we are tilting a away from the sun, and the amount of solar energy hitting the Earth each year is steadily reducing. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting pretty. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can handle this! <laughs> But where is it all coming from? And is it really the only thing that could be making the Earth warmer? There's a fancy graph on Bloom that does quite a colourful job of this, and that's what matters. No need for a paper bag here. This graph first shows the temperature changes we've seen on Earth since 1880. It then maps on the same graph a collection of possible causes. Here, for example, is the estimated heating and cooling effect that the sun's orbit will have had on our temperature over that same period. The same has been done for the effects of volcanoes, deforestation and land use, and even the ozone layer. All of these effects combined don't seem to show any significant impact on the CO2 or temperature changes we're seeing on Earth. Based on what we know about CO2, how it has affected our temperature in the past, and a lack of any other culprits, CO2 is generally deemed the most likely cause for the increase to the Earth's temperature we've seen in the last 100 years. In that case, then, it's important to look at why the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere are increasing so much. And if you were to go with what everyone else is saying, you'd probably hear the words fossil fuels. But what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are basically just plants and animals that died millions of years ago. Over time, these animals sank into the ground and eventually turned into coal and oil. This happens because coal and oil is mostly just carbon, and plants and animals too are mainly carbon. That's what people mean when they say we are carbon-based life forms. When we burn these carbon-based fuels for energy, the carbon in them reacts with oxygen, carbon dioxide is made, and the circle of life is complete. The circle. The reason a lot of people are saying burning fossil fuels is the cause of the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is because we only really started burning them in bulk around this sort of time period, which we call the Industrial Revolution. This is when trains and factories really started burning coal and oil and gas for energy. Very shortly after this is when we started to see the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, which we're still seeing today. But again, how do we know it was the burning of fossil fuels that caused this increase in CO2? It could just be a coincidence. Well, there's an interesting fact about the air around us that may provide some answers. You see, when air floats up into the sky, it actually absorbs cosmic rays from space. 
This eventually causes this air to contain a very small amount of carbon that is radioactive. This is called carbon-14, and all the fresh air around us contains a tiny amount. The carbon in fossil fuels, however, has been trapped away underground for millions of years. This carbon hasn't seen cosmic rays for a very long time, so contains almost no carbon-14. This also means whenever fossil fuels are burnt, they produce CO2 gas that has almost no carbon-14. This graph shows us the average amounts of carbon-14 that have been present in our atmosphere since the 1880s. Over time, we've seen the levels of carbon-14 steadily reducing since the Industrial Revolution. This indicates that the atmosphere is being filled with carbon dioxide that has much lower levels of carbon-14, and the most likely source of this CO2 is from burning fossil fuels. Even more interestingly, we were only able to measure this effect until the 1950s, which is when we started detonating nuclear bombs on Earth. Because these bombs make the air around us substantially more radioactive, we can no longer really rely on this method. They irradiated their own planet? That's right, Quark. There are also atoms called carbon-13 in the air that actually tell us similar things to carbon-14. These levels aren't affected by setting off nuclear bombs. So we can see here, carbon-13 levels in the atmosphere have also dropped steadily in the same way carbon-14 has. So if all this theory is true, then it's all carbon's fault. <laughs> Oh no, I'm making it worse! The Earth warming a few degrees as it's currently set to do so, based on the current amount of CO2 we are producing, will bring a variety of issues to every single part of the world. There's no need to go into detail about any of these, as you can probably guess, though a few examples would be the ice caps melting will likely cause widespread flooding. Large areas will get too hot to live and grow food, and forest fires will continue to get far more frequent. Stuff like that. Trying to reduce the amount of CO2 we make then is all well and good, but what do we change? Everything? Go full into the wild and eat nothing but sweet peas and starve to death with a tear of happiness in our eyes that we did the right thing? A lot of the information and graphics coming up were provided by Dr. Simon Clark, and if you're interested in these types of videos, he makes them a lot more regularly than me. So please do have a look. So here's a rough breakdown of where all the human produced CO2 comes from. See, if we're gonna trim things down, we must first inspect the stems. <laughs> the main thing to note here is that 72% of all our CO2 emissions comes from energy use. Oh well, simple. No! Energy use is such a big chunk because so much of our energy comes from burning the big bad Fs. What? Oh, fossil fuels, sorry. <laughs> If we expand this, we can see that 43% of this chunk is from making electricity and the burning of fuel such as natural gas, which is also a fossil fuel, for heating and cooking. A whole 17% is also from transport, so cars and planes and boats and such. Here is the area we must focus on first, simply as it's the biggest area. To reduce this whole delicious... Slice. We must first simply use less fossil fuels and more renewable energy. Now this all sounds like a lot of fairy tale perfect world where we power cars on princess farts and happy thoughts, but if we look into it, renewable energy is stuff like biofuels, solar panels, and wind turbines. It's called renewable because once it's set up, it can make energy effectively forever. We take energy from places like the sun and the wind and use it to make power. We don't have to dig giant holes in the ocean or deserts to mine coal or suck up oil and we have an endless source of low cost energy. And that's because renewable energy is not this economic hole of depressing expense. In 2016, the fossil fuel industry was subsidized $360 billion by governments to keep it on the path it's on, versus renewable, which was given $140 billion. Renewable energy was subsidized less than half of fossil fuels, even though in America, renewables are by far the fastest growing energy resource, and solar energy is the fastest growing in the world. And because it makes economical sense, the transition is happening. In 2016, 26.5% percent of the world's electrical energy came from renewables. This is due in part because 146 of 197 countries have set targets to increase renewable energy for electricity. Green electricity is hip. Dog. But this is only for electricity. It doesn't include natural gas for heating and cooking, which is a huge part of this deadly but delicious pie. Only 10.3% of the energy we use to produce heat is from renewable sources. This is likely because renewable gas is less trendy. Only 48 countries have set targets to use increased amounts of renewable gas. The same is true of transport. Only 0.3% of our cars and planes and such use renewable energy. As you can probably see then, a big part of this is all Politics. Oh, my favorite. It's largely down to politicians and governments to choose to start building more renewable energy sources, stop subsidizing fossil fuels so much, and instead start subsidizing renewable energy. This 
may seem obvious, but most parties in any election release a document outlining all of their claims. All you really need to do is search for terms you care about, like renewable, and you can compare the pledges and see who is doing what. I did this for two of the leading UK party's most recent documents, and as we can see here, one of our leading parties clearly doesn't give a flying To switch, I searched 100% green energy provider and found a comparison page that listed companies by how much of their energy is sourced from renewables. The best one to find is one that provides 100% green electricity and gas, which as we discussed isn't a huge priority. Finally, let's talk about the cow in the room. The uh, Spectre burger at the feast? The beef in the mouth? Stop! Now, I'm about to suggest that if you aren't already, that you don't go vegetarian or vegan. So hold on to your horse. Meat. You see, agriculture and the production of food is the next biggest cause of CO2 emissions, which makes sense given that we all, you know, eat food. But what foods produce the most CO2? Here are a selection of foods and the average amounts of CO2 they produce per kilo of that food. So right out of the gate, cows produce the most CO2. Now this is because cows mostly eat grass, and grass is basically inedible. What? This means cows have to ferment grass in their numerous tum-tums, which in turn creates methane gas which they then burp or fart out. <coughs> This is troublesome because methane is actually 84 times more effective at heating the earth than CO2 is. So this is why everything to do with cows is pretty large. Animal farm ing, is generally the biggest contribution because animals fart a lot, need a lot of food, and need big fields to pasture. Is, is pasture a verb? Generally, fruit and veg are the low offenders because they're just plants. Now, I'm a vegetarian and have been since I cooked the beef wellington and I swear these two events are completely unrelated. The thing is, people don't want to go vegetarian or vegan and honestly I don't blame them. Look at this delicious chicken! I also think nothing puts people off this topic more than being told by a total stranger what they should and shouldn't be eating. All I hope to do is show you these stats and let you make up your own minds based on what you want to do. It seems the best starting point for anyone who wants to get involved in this is to simply try eating less beef products or products relating to it. Interestingly, poultry is far less responsible than many other foods. So giving up cheese, for example, in place of eating more chicken also makes perfect sense if that's what you want to do and you don't mind executing a few chicken. The point is, if you want to get involved, just mess around with your diet. Throw in an asparagus occasionally. And that's it, really. I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned at least one fact something to do with chickens.